And thank you everyone who showed up to today's workshop. Um, as Arpin said, we're going to be covering honeybee energy modeling. Uh, and this is, this is part one. Uh, we're going to cover a second part of honeybee energy modeling next, uh, next Tuesday. Um, and just so that you guys have some context, especially if you're, if you're new arrivals from, uh, uh, to just the honeybee part of the series, if you missed the ladybug part, uh, I just want to put, put in context what we're going to be working on in, in terms of the uh, larger insect community, if you will, or the number of insects, uh, number of plugins, I guess, for a grasshopper that, that do uh, energy modeling. Uh, and even before that, I just want to say sort of kind of what we're covering in this whole uh, set of two, part one and part two on energy modeling. Uh, today, we're going to focus, I, I, just so that you guys are, are kind of clear from the, the start of what exactly we're going to be doing, uh, I'm going to keep it just because we have a small amount of time. We're going to be looking at just one, one sort of room or zone at a time with Honeybee, although you can certainly do much larger uh, models. Uh, and I'm doing this because I think it's the best way to show you how to usefully apply energy modeling if it's just a small, simple model. And so we're going to focus today on just reducing energy use in a cold climate. Uh, we're going to have a program of an office. Uh, the focus is going to be on energy use. We're going to sort of build up zones. I mean, we're going to use a certain method for building up the, that, that one zone. Uh, and then next Tuesday is going to be the big focus, whereas we're going to focus on heating. We're going to focus on commercial office programs uh, today. Uh, next Tuesday, we're going to be uh, focusing on cooling, on eliminating a cooling system uh, while still trying to make a, a space comfortable. Uh, it's going to be in a hot climate, and it's going to be for residents. So I'm trying to cover sort of a range of typical building types that we can cover here um, as best as I can for the uh, you know three to four hours that we have between these two sessions. Uh, so that's just so you guys know where, we're, where we are. And to get to sort of the wider insect community, well, to more specifically, I guess, get to today's uh, schedule first. Uh, I'm going to give a first 30-minute intro on just sort of intro to energy modeling, um, especially if because I imagine there's some people on here who uh, energy modeling might be something new to them. And, uh, and I, I, I just want to sort of start off with maybe just a set of advice that uh, I, I wish I had heard when I first started energy modeling and just, just some basic things about uh, really what Honeybee is meant to do uh, and what, what we imagine the energy modeling capabilities of Honeybee really being used to do. Uh, then we're gonna, I'm going to walk you through setting up a basic energy model, visualizing some of the results. Um, hopefully that will have happen in a half hour, could be a little longer. Uh, and then we're going to try and just spend a huge chunk of time just improving that energy model so that you guys get a sense of how you would actually apply this uh, in the design process to test out some different strategies like changing glazing, shading, window U value, uh, and adding some things to the HVAC. Um, Okay, so with that, um, just so that you guys are aware, so this is what I meant by the larger insect community. Uh, there are actually four insects altogether, uh, just in case, and I'd shown these in the first part, uh, that all are sort of under this, this umbrella term of ladybug analysis tools. Uh, and two of these you don't have to worry about, we're not covering in the, really in the series much at all, which are a CFD modeler uh, called Butterfly, or a connection rather to a CFD modeler called uh, that then the plugin's name is Butterfly, uh, then Dragonfly, which is for large scale modeling. But really, the only things we're covering in the whole, in the performance network series that I'm doing, uh, or uh, this this time of, I mean, yeah, in, in I guess what we're in the middle of right now are Ladybug and Honeybee, and we've already kind of covered Ladybug uh, in the first two workshops, um, and so we're now past that. And we're now this one is going to be the next three workshops, or the next six actually, because these are. I, we're going to do part one and part two for each of these, uh, and it's all going to be focused on Honeybee. Um, and Honeybee is generally meant for building energy, uh, for daylight and comfort modeling for several of these things. And just to give you a visual of sort of all that Honeybee is meant to do, uh, well, first, I mean, Ladybug, if, if you guys are just coming in, it, what we already worked with was just a, a uh, uh, Ladybug is just meant to sort of visualize and analyze weather data uh, using the Rhino Grasshopper interface. And Honeybee, which is the big focus of, of what we're working on now, it's this big, you know, it's this node in this much larger network of software uh, that is meant to do all of these different things. But notably, it's, it's a plug-in for the Rhino Grasshopper interface. So it's, it's a plug-in for one of the most common interfaces that designers are using uh, to 3D model. Uh, and, it's, and Honeybee connects out to these two uh, key engines for daylight modeling. 
and specifically those are the open source uh, physics-based rendering engine called Radiance, uh, and we use that to evaluate daylight, to do very like uh, deep evaluations of daylight and glare, uh, and then there's DaySim, which is mostly just a, a set of libraries and tools that help you run uh, daylight simulations for an entire year uh, and coordinate that. Uh, and then, uh, and then, sort of in this other connection out here, we're gonna we're gonna cover this in uh, workshop four, by the way, the daylight stuff. Um, in the final workshop, we're gonna cover Thurm and Window in workshop five in those two parts. Um, and Thurm and Window, those are mostly meant to do detailed construction, uh, you know, evaluation, evaluating things like R values and U values, uh, and understanding a phenomena called thermal bridging. Uh, and all, they're also pretty useful for condensation risk. So that's that's another thing that Honeybee links out to. And then finally, the main focus, what we're going to be working with today, outlined here in red, uh, is Honeybee's connection to uh, well, a a full building energy model modeling program called Energy Plus, which is a uh, Department of Energy supported uh, uh, engine basically for simulating the energy use of buildings. And we're also going to be working with a connection to Open Studio, which is pretty much just an interface for Energy Plus. Uh, it makes it very easy to set up things like HVAC systems based on templates uh, and, and you know has a bunch of default libraries for different building types that make it much easier to use uh, the engine. Uh, and so, yeah, so we're going to be working with uh, thermal energy use, so heating and cooling, uh, HVAC sizing and, and thermal comfort over there over this part one and part two of the series. Okay, so that's just so you know where we are um, in the larger scheme of things. Uh, and I said that I was going to sort of open with a sort of introduction to energy modeling uh, and just talk about some some advice on energy modeling, uh, which even like I even I'm sure a lot of this is relevant to seasoned uh, veteran energy modelers. Uh, who, are, who are on this right now, but uh, but it's particularly this is one of the first times that you're you're coming to this uh, this webinar to sort of learn and get a sense of how you would energy model. Uh, you definitely want to listen to what I'm about to tell you, because uh, I really wish someone had told me this when I had first started off energy modeling, uh, maybe which was I guess what almost five years ago. Um, so all right, so the first the biggest biggest piece of advice that I have for anyone who's who's you know starting off with energy modeling, especially. Uh, is that energy modeling is difficult. Uh, it's this is it's a fact. It is it is. There's no real way of 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 having a, a, a energy model that is not at least somewhat complex. Uh, and anyone who tries to tell you that oh it's just simple, you just follow four easy steps and you get this, that that person probably has not done a lot of of energy modeling on on real projects. Uh, because the reality is it's, it's very difficult. People make entire PhDs out of it, entire professions out of it. Uh, and the reason why it's so difficult is that it's just even the simplest energy model, uh, it has a hundred, more than a hundred inputs. It has so many different things that influence it. You have all the different aspects of the climate, like the sun, the outdoor temperature, the humidity, the uh, uh, the wind, all of these things affect your building. You have all the, the different ways that occupants can use the building. Uh, you have all the different ways that walls and windows can be constructed, all the different geometries that are possible. There are just so many, many inputs to an energy model. It's incredibly complex. Um, but however complex an energy model is, it's important to keep in mind that reality contains millions, millions of inputs. There are just, it, reality itself is so incredibly complex. Um, and really, our energy models are just abstractions of that reality. They're just sort of where we're, we're just taking out certain parts of reality that we know are important to this phenomena that we're looking at, uh, and we're and we're trying to model those the, that reality. Uh, so I mean, I guess I just say this to give you a sense that there's an enormous amount of complexity that is involved uh, both in energy models and in what we are actually trying to model, which are real buildings. Um, and so because there are just so many inputs, uh, it's going to take you time to test out all these different inputs and figure out what matters, understand why there are you know, only certain things in the abstraction of our energy model, uh, and understand what, for what aspects of a building you can probably take a default assumption and it will be okay, and what things are really important that you model accurately. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of time of testing because these these things that matter aren't always the same for all buildings and all and in all situations. Um, and so, just to give you a sense of like of what's going to happen if you you know if you dive right into to 
to energy modeling without necessarily understanding what all these inputs are at first, as I did, let's say, five years ago. Uh, oh, uh, but before that, I just want to say, yeah, before actually jumping into what actually happens when you try an energy model, uh, I just want to say that we ha we've already had a, a webinar series on Ladybug. Uh, because energy modeling is so difficult, I really recommend that you guys use you can before trying to jump into the enormous complexity of modeling full buildings with Honeybee. Um, and so, and this is just a general piece of advice. I mean, even in just in the design process, even if you are a seasoned energy modeler, uh, you want to start just by looking at simple things like climate graphics and ladybug and doing simple analyses before you, you jump into the advanced stuff. Uh, and the sort of mantra that we have in the community for like the way that we say you should use ladybug before honeybee uh, is don't build the energy model if you haven't checked the sun path. That there are some basic fundamental things that you should be doing first that you should understand about your site and about your climate um, before you, you dive into doing something as complex as an energy model. Um, so, okay, so with that piece of advice out there, just to now kind of give you a sense of what happens when you try and engage this complexity with it, uh, you know, uh, while maybe, let's say, taking a lot of default inputs, is that, all right, this, this is, and this is what I thought I'd initially, initially do when I first started energy modeling with Honeybee, is I thought, all right, I'm going to create a zone, I'm going to create like a room that I want to understand the energy use of, I'm going to create that geometry in Rhino, I'm going to bring it into Grasshopper and assign all these properties that, that you know, um, that relate to the energy use of that, like the wall constructions, like how occupants occupy the space, uh, when they turn the lights on, all these different things. I'm going to assign these things, and I'm going to change those properties, those default assumptions, to reflect what I'm going to build, because probably all those default properties are not really what I wanted to do. Um, I'm going to run the model. And then, it, you know, at first I thought, all right, and then I'll, I'll bring in the results, and I thought, this is it. All right, that's what I'll have to do, step by step by step. It's going to be done. I'm going to get an end, you know, useful stuff out of this. I just have to follow these three, these simple steps. And what you find whenever you build an energy model like this is that the first thing that you get out, uh, it's always, it's always going to be garbage. <laughs> uh, especially in the first few projects that you do, the first energy model that you build is never really going to be an accurate representation of of the of of the reality that that your building is probably going to occupy. There's always going to be some assumption that you're making that you realized was not correct. Uh, and But the very important thing is that it's not so much that you have a fast way of going through this whole process of setting up geometry, assigning properties. What makes it really important is that after you've loaded the results, realize that there are things that are wrong, uh, is that you have tools to really understand the results, understand what's going on, realize that, okay, this, this assumption in the model is not correct. And when you do that, you'll, you'll change some properties to, you know, within the model to reflect what you build. Uh, and you know, and you'll rerun it, and you'll say, "Okay, that's fixed." But something, you know, it, inevitably, there's probably things aren't going to be fixed just with that one change. So you're probably going to have to look at these results, understand them again, and then change some more properties. This is going to be a bit of an iterative process, usually. While you're validating the model to yourself, you're going to probably do this many, many, many times um, before finally, you know, you'll take a look at the results and you'll say to yourself. Okay, this makes sense. I have, I finally have something useful, and you've sunk in a huge amount of time. Maybe you're already setting up this, uh, you know, this model, really validating and understanding what's going on in it. But finally, you're at a break-even point. You have something that you can actually apply. But of course, I mean, it's we don't just end there. We don't just build usually an accurate model. If we really, really want to pull the value off of it, we don't stop at this point. But what we do is that we look at those results. We actually understand. All right, if this is the reality of what we would build then maybe this design isn't very good. Maybe we want to try a different strategy, try something else in the energy model. Um, and then, you know, with that, we'll change some of those properties to reflect that strategy, to reflect how we'd implement it. We'd run the model and we'll see the results. And then we're probably going to run through several design options. We're going to run through many, many things with this while we actually design with the model. And it's in, finally in this last step that we end up with something that is truly but we end up with a great design. We don't just end up with a useful tool. We end up with garbage. We get something that that um, that really we can point to and say this has value uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and so I do. I run through this just to give you guys a sense of that. This is a very. It's a long process. 
Um, and yeah, and there's, there's a lot of iterating that you're going to be doing, a lot of understanding results. And the most important thing in an interface for energy modeling is that you have a really good means of understanding all the complex inputs and visualizing them and making them clear to you, making the assumptions clear to you. Uh, even more so than just a fast way of, let's just run the model. All right. So now there's an important question that we'd have to ask. If it takes so long, if we have to do all this iteration, if we have to do all this stuff, uh, is it worth it to energy model at all? Uh, and this is it's this is a valid question. And I mean, and <laughs> and it's not always worth it to energy model. As you guys remember, I said in the start, that you should really exhaust the usefulness of ladybug. Uh, and if you haven't checked things like the sun path, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be building an energy model. Uh, <laughs> so I mean, so there is there is a basic level that you should have in order to build an energy model. Um, but I will say, I mean, of course, you guys, we're about to embark on a, you know, three to four hour tutorial series just on energy modeling. So, of course, the answer to this isn't simply no. Uh, and I mean, and I'll, I'll, I'll qualify the answer to this. I mean, I'll say that probably the energy modeling for your first few projects isn't really, I mean, you're going to make a lot of mistakes the first few times. It's going to be, you know, you're going to get that garbage the first time that you, you, you build the model. It won't necessarily pay off. But the most valuable thing that you pull from energy modeling, it really isn't that necessarily that application for that one process, project or that, you know, that one thing that was really good on, on your, first, your first attempt at it. Uh, but really where things pay off is that over time, you're going to build an intuition about what matters most. Uh, what, what are the really important things that I need to make sure I focus on to have a good design, a good performing building? And this intuition is invaluable. Um, and I just want to try and make this clear that we're, you know, it's, don't, well, first I'm saying don't be discouraged if things don't work out in your first project. If, if things, if you realize you end up making completely, you know, bad assumptions or something, in the end, what's the most important thing, the thing that you take to the next, the next level is your intuition. Um, and you can even think about this if a lot of you are listening to this, if you've gone through, let's say you've gone, you're a designer, if you think back to architecture school and you remember the first design that you ever created. And you probably think to yourself now, like, wow, that was, that was pretty terrible, <laughs> uh, as, as I might myself. But, uh, but, you know, of course, you're in the process of learning. And because you stuck it out, because you kept designing through that, you now have an incredibly good intuition about how to make buildings well. Um, and, you know, and that's, that's exactly, it's the same sort of principle with energy modeling. It's a long-term thing. All right. So, I mean, just to give a sort of, I mean, not to harp too much on sort of the, the uh, how exactly things pay off is that, yeah, you're going to invest a lot of time up front just understanding how to set up energy models, how to work with Honeybee, uh, and you're probably going to spend even a longer amount of time just validating them to yourself, just understanding all the assumptions, making sure that they make sense, making sure that they're a representation of what you might build. And this is going to take a huge amount of time to basically get you, you know, what seems like nowhere, that you invest, you know, you haven't really drawn any real value from the model just doing these two. But once you get to this point, this is when the magic happens. Once you have enough experience of understanding exactly how this model works, the, the gains are going, to be, are going to be exponential, that you're going to suddenly start to pull a lot, a lot of value out of this. And just to give you guys a sense of really what this value is that, you know, what happens when you hit this exponential part of the curve, is that you look at, say, you know, what, how vernacular architecture forms emerged. Like, I mean, for example, like how the igloo emerged. Uh, over over time, over centuries of the Inuit living in, in North America. And, you know, and it wasn't, you know, at first it probably it wasn't the advanced structure we see with, you know, the thick insulated snow or, or with the, you know, the kind of underground passageway that makes sure that the heat, the hot air gets trapped. Uh, you know, it was probably something much simpler. And it took many, many iterations over generations of people building all these different structures till finally this vernacular architecture emerged. Uh, and you can say the same thing. I mean, the igloo is one example. This is, uh, I mean, maybe we could say the world's first refrigerator, uh, the Yakchal in Iran, um, was, you know, originally just people just started burying snow in the ground and realized it stayed frozen for longer, uh, which is also how they made the world's first ice cream um, in Iran. But, I mean, over time they added a shallow pool to help collect water, and, you know, they improved the structure of the dome over iterations and iterations of this, you know, eventually in centuries of, of Iranian civilization, they arrived at, you know, the state-of-the-art art refrigerator for the time, passive refrigerator, I should say, um, because, of course, they didn't, they didn't really have air conditioning back then. Um, but it's this century-long process 
it's this, this process of iteration that energy modeling is really helping you with. Uh, and I mean, maybe just to give another example here, n not just on a civilization time scale, uh, but on the time scale of one architect who I admire a lot, Mike Reynolds. Uh, after he finished architecture school, he just he said he was, you know, didn't necessarily want to do what what conventionally a lot of architects were doing at the time. Uh, and he just went out to the deserts outside Taos, New Mexico, and started building structures out of garbage and living in these structures and understanding how they, you know, how they worked, how how they could be improved. And over this man's entire life, he built all of these structures out of earth and, and, and uh, refuse and all these different things uh, until finally he merged, you know, in his older age, he finally condensed all that he knew into this one, you know, one structure that had dimensions that he knew if he stuck to those, he knew it would work. Um, he knew that if he, the glazing was the right size, it could make it thermally comfortable. You know, he, he could build it off the grid if he had this amount of, of you know, solar panels. And he discovered, you know, I mean, a modern vernacular. Over the course of his life, by building and iterating and living in these places over and over again, he arrived at something that is, you know, that that is is was truly truly valuable. Like a an actual something that is born out of out of experience and, and out of many many iterations. And it's really it's on the scale of like a civilization or of a lifetime. It's this is the scale that energy modeling is helping with because with energy modeling. This process, this very, very long process, you can go through in a matter of months. And the reason why you can go through it in a matter of months is because you don't have to physically build every single time that you want to test something out. That all that you have to do, I mean, it's still pretty difficult because there are a lot of inputs that you might have to change. But all that you have to do when you want to test out a certain strategy is change the computer model. And this is incredibly powerful. This is, this, this is, this is really the space where energy modeling really pays off. Uh, and just to give you an example, of, let's say, of how I've tried to use this in my own, for, for my architecture thesis, I used an energy model to build these detailed uh, microclimate maps that you see here, uh, which we're going we're gonna to go through these in part two of Honeybee. We're going to go through these microclimate maps to show you guys how to generate these from an energy model. Uh, and just in the same way that, you know, that the Inuit tried many different iterations of the igloo. Um, I tried many, all these different geometric and types of strategy uh, uh, variations of, a, of just a simple test box of an apartment. Um, and I tried many of these. These are just a few. And from testing out, looking at the hottest times of the year in Los Angeles, um, I was trying to find out the strategies that would make the spaces the most comfortable. And I picked out in boxes here those that were performing the best. Like, you know, let's say, I mean, one that ended up being really important was the fact that if you secluded a sort of central space, a thermally massive central space away from the perimeter, you can get this nice area that remains cool into the hottest parts of the day uh, in the desert climate of Los Angeles. Uh, and so something like that I was then able to take and say, all right, I understand this principle. I'm going to take these strategies here. I'm going to make this big, you know, bigger common space, this thermally massive common space, uh, and I'm going to use this to generate a design. And, and it was only by iterating through all these test boxes that I could arrive at this type of modern vernacular. Um, and so, you know, at the end of it, I ended up with some sort of apartment design, like what you see here. And not just that, that I could use those same thermal maps that I used to, to test out all those variations. I could prove, I could show, like, look, these, these, you know, spaces, these thermally massive spaces are really comfortable into the heat of the day, into 4 p.m. in the hottest part of the uh, of Los Angeles' uh, year uh, and day. Uh, and so, and so, I mean, it's really, it's through, I mean, there's no way I could have arrived at something that I knew worked this well without first trying to simulate these things. Uh, and so this is just, I mean, I'm just trying to show you examples of how I'm cross-cutting all these, like, centuries of iterating and actually building these things. Uh, I did the same thing for New York in, in cold times. This is, so this was all without any HVAC also. I was just trying to do things perfectly passively. And so keeping places warm has more to do with letting in the sun uh, and trapping heat from the kitchens and stuff. Uh, and from that, I also built a very similar type of strategy uh, and such that I knew that I could make spaces that were warm in the morning by taking advantage of the sun, building a sunroom, and in the evening taking advantage of all the heat generated from kitchens in these central spaces to keep people warm. And so I mean this is just this is just showing you some of the potentials of really what energy modeling allows you to do if you've if you've you know you're using it to its full potential. Um, and maybe here's just another example. I mean, some of you guys have already seen this, some of the things I'm showing you, but this is something that Mustafa, the founder of Ladybug, uh, had made 
it's a fully open source, which I like, interface for, for just visualizing hundreds of, of energy simulations. Uh, and the very nice thing that you can do here is that you can say, like, all right, if I only want the buildings that have cooling below this threshold or heating below that threshold. And we, because, you know, we've run and maybe we want really good daylight but not too much glare. And you could select out, out of this whole huge design space of possibilities, those designs which perform the best, that give me, like, the best, the best performing criteria. And you can click on these things and actually and, and understand how they work. So it's really, it's in this, this ability to understand the full potential of what, what we can build. Uh, and this, this ability, this, this time machine that we get to cross-cut centuries and lifetimes. This is really the big payoff of energy modeling. And I say this because a lot of people run in and they think, okay, it's initially going to make, you know, it's immediately going to make my project more valuable. Uh, and, I, and, you know, and I just want to say it's not necessarily a time machine for your specific project. It's a time machine to cross-cut these, these, this knowledge that we build up over centuries and, 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 and lifetimes. Uh, and so just, I'm, I'm just trying to make things clear. So don't get discouraged if immediately it doesn't seem to pay off on a project. Um, or, you know, or don't be discouraged if it takes a long time even to apply it on a project. It's, it's really, it's this long-term payoff that, that you guys just should stay focused on. All right, so with that, I just, I want to say, all right, so that's a kind of motivational introduction to energy modeling. And some of you probably already heard that, and I apologize, because that's a part of my YouTube tutorial series on energy modeling. Um, I open with that, and, because, and I just feel it's important to tell everyone that because I want people's expectations to be in the right place and understand what our, what our end goals are for this. Um, but with that, I mean, because there's also a lot of other newer people on here, I just want to just start off with the, just a few of the most basics of energy modeling. Uh, just, just, and I'm going to go through this quick because I know a lot of you probably already know this, and it's just review from, uh, you know, college or or, uh, or or high school even. Um, but I just want to say, all right, the basis of all energy modeling, the the key thing that we're going to be calculating today, what we're going to be simulating, uh, is the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, the first law of thermodynamics. This is probably one of the most important uh, things of modern science. Uh, it's partly, you know, something that really touched off the, 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 the modern day industrial revolution, our knowledge of this. And if you guys are forgetting what the first law of thermodynamics is, it's that energy can never be created or destroyed. And this may seem, I mean, it's a bold, you know, powerful statement in it, but it may not necessarily seem very applicable to buildings uh, until I start to say that, well, if energy can never be created or destroyed, therefore, the energy that goes into any system over time has to equal the energy that leaves that system. Energy is never, it's not going, it's not going to be destroyed, it's not going to be created anywhere. So it always, if it always has to be preserved, that's what goes in equals that which goes out. And the way that this is particularly relevant to buildings is that the energy that goes into our building, like, I mean, well, I'm going to give you a bunch of examples of, of energy that goes into our building in a second. Uh, that has to equal all the energy that leaves the building. And this is, this calculation, of equals to equals is exactly what we're going to be doing today. And so uh, if we just uh, sort of ask ourselves, all right, what are some of the energies, the types of energy that go into the building? And if I was teaching a class of completely new people, I would ask people to raise their hands and tell me uh, what, what are some of the energies uh, that go into buildings. And I'll give you two seconds to guess uh, before I tell you that there are a lot of different types of energy that goes into our building. Uh, we have all of human beings, we all produce heat. Uh, we all produce, I mean, at least about 100 watts or so, which is about, you know, if you remember what those 100 watt light bulbs, we all produce that much heat as a person. Uh, we have computers and appliances that all produce heat. All that energy, that electricity that goes into power your computer eventually ends up as heat in the, in your, inside your building. Uh, we have light bulbs producing heat, and especially something you guys are really going to understand today, we have a lot of sunlight, solar energy, solar radiation, solar heat coming through the windows. Um, so those are some of the examples. All that heat that gets generated inside the building that goes into the building, it has to equal energy that leaves the building. And the ways that energy can leave, I'll also give you two seconds before I tell you that, a lot of energy leaves through just conduction through the walls. The fact that, you know, usually it's warmer on, side, on the inside of our buildings and outside, so a lot of heat will just flow across our walls to the outside. Um, but we also have, you know, air that seeps in, cold air that can seep in from the outside, uh, and that's another way that we, that our buildings lose heat. Uh, we also, I mean, a lot of times, especially in spaces that we're occupying, 
we want to bring in fresh air to the, for, uh, to our building. Uh, and that also, that heat loss through ventilation is very important. And so really, the, all the software that we're going to be working with today is just running this calculation. And it's running it over and over and over again, many, many times for each and every like 15 minutes of the year. And what this allows us to do is that whatever term, you know, that this, well, this equation isn't always equal, as, as you might understand, that you may have more heat from people and, you know, more on a certain side at a different time. But the way that our buildings work is that we try and make up for that by adding in heat from a heating system or removing heat with an air conditioning system. Um, and this is essentially how it works. Is whatever is left over from this calculation, that is what, that is the heating or cooling that our building uses. Um, all right, and this, so I mean, a lot of you probably already know this. You know that this is how energy models work, but it's just very important. I, yeah, I would just feel very bad teaching how to energy model without just saying this at first. And actually, one of the first things that we're going to do once we build an energy model is that we're going to visualize this. We're going to actually visualize the output of the energy balance uh, for a space. Okay, all right, so just all right, a brief history of, of what's under the hood, because you guys can actually, you, and I'd encourage you, if you've never done this before, you really actually should, you really shouldn't be energy modeling unless you've done a hand calculation of something like this before. Uh, doing a hand calculation is, is actually very useful with just understanding these different terms. Uh, but we're using a, a computational engine to help us solve this equation. And just so that you have an understanding of what, uh, what this engine is, where it comes from, and its history, um, I, I first, I want to go all the way back to 1980 and say that one of the first energy modeling engines that ever arose happened in the energy crisis in the U.S. in the 1980s. Uh, it was called DOE2 or Department of Energy 2, uh, and it's uh, you know it's a it's a pretty it was rough software at the time, uh, but you know it was able to accurately predict that energy use of buildings by solving that equation uh, that I just showed you guys. And so around 1990 or so, they made an interface for this, this DO2 engine called eQuest. And to this day, this is still what most of the building industry uses. They use this, this engine called DO2 using the interface called eQuest. So just bear in mind, actually, that the time scale that our energy simulation operates on. This is, this is another indication. The same way that I say that you cross-cut centuries and, and lifetimes, if this is any indication, this software that most people are using today is from the 80s. It's like over 30 years old. So if this just gives you a sense that we're operating on a different time scale when we use this um, than with other software that you might be familiar with. Uh, now, of course, a lot has happened uh, between now and, and 1980. Uh, so because of that, there is another engine that arose called Energy Plus. And this is actually, you guys already remember from the beginning, this is the one that we're going to be using. Uh, this is the one that Honeybee plugs into. And I should have said, I didn't send out install instructions, but I'll point you guys in the right direction to make sure that you get, get everything installed. Um, but uh, yeah, but Energy Plus is the engine that we're using. It was started in 1995, so it's, it's young, I guess. Uh, <laughs> at least it was started after the internet uh, was created. Um, and so, and, and it's been, you know, improved over the last 20 years. It's been more and more features to this day. I mean, and yeah, to the, at this point, there are very few things that you can't simulate in Energy Plus, although you'll probably have to be smart about some of the assumptions that you make. Um, and also, importantly, we're going to be using an interface for Energy Plus called Open Studio. And this is what Honeybee is directly plugging into. And Open Studio is only, it's for, I say only, it's from 2008 when it was first released. Um, and it's actually it's still undergoing a lot of development. Um, so, uh, so just just bear that in mind. I mean, we actually Honeybee plugs directly into Energy Plus if you want to, but most of the most powerful things are in Open Studio right now. Um, all right, so that's just so you guys are aware of where we are. And before I jump right into uh, the actual, you know, building up an energy model for you guys and showing you how things work. I just want you guys to be aware, if you haven't checked these out, uh, there is a this solid five hours of video tutorials on Honeybee Energy Modeling that I put up already. Uh, it's a bit old at this point, this playlist, um, but, uh, but it's, you know, it's from 2015. But I would really recommend there are some things in here that I won't get the chance to cover. Um, and, and I'm kind of starting from scratch because there's so much that has changed in the last uh, two years in Honeybee. Uh, and especially there's been so much that's changed in terms of open studio development, too, that I'm going to... I mean, I'm going to be hopefully updating you guys on today. All right, so I'm sorry. I know a lot of this was review also, especially if you guys have already seen my video tutorial series. You know I open with my advice on energy modeling. Um, but, yeah, but thanks, guys, for making it through this far. And, yeah, now we're at just about the right time. Let's dive into actually setting up an energy model. So, 
ARPIN should have sent out the um, some files that we're going to be using just to help us. I mean, because we have such a short amount of time, I don't want to spend too much time generating geometry. Uh, if you don't have the files, though, this is really this is especially one exercise that you can do just by building a box. You know, literally with a single command, you can get you know. I don't know, I can make a 10 meter by 10 meter by 3 meter box. So if you don't have the example files, don't worry too much. Uh, just make a box and you'll, you know, and you can probably follow along just as well. Uh, but I like to try and make things exciting. So I, I have, this is actually a, uh, um, a real site. Uh, <laughs> it's actually uh, right outside uh, my, my, the offices that I work in. Uh, and we're going to be modeling a small section of a fully glass building, uh, fully glass office building today. I'm going to turn this off. We're actually just going to be focusing on modeling this one part of this one floor. Um, and I'm starting off very simple just because I think, I think it's, one, it's, it's clearly very useful for people just starting out with energy modeling. But I think it's also the best way for the advanced people uh, to show you all the new features in Honeybee rather than getting lost in the geometry. Um, but you'll see, I, I actually, I'll give you an example. We're going to do a little bit of, of multi-zone, uh, larger, more complex energy modeling modeling next session. Uh, but we're just going to start off with this with the single zone of the office at first. All right. So and actually I'm going to turn off the context. I'm going to turn off this office building. Let's we're just going to focus on and I mean maybe we'll get a sense. So what we're simulating here, there's a core to this office building and we're just going to simulate this big open office space. And we're going to try out a bunch of different strategies. We'll say maybe this this whole building uh, is or this whole section of a building here is up for renovation, uh, and right now this is actually. If you guys even remember, I'll, I'll even give you more of a hint. If you guys remember from the last session, I showed you a picture of an all glass building with the shades down. Uh, that's the one we're actually modeling right here. Uh, so we're going to start off modeling it the way it is, all glass, um, and uh, and we're just going to model one floor because we don't, you know, we could model a whole building if we want to. Uh, but it's going to be much faster. We're going to be able to iterate much better if we only look at one floor and we, you know, we just take the assumption that all the other floors are pretty similar to that one. Um, all right. And with that, uh, and maybe maybe I'll even turn off the context here. So you guys will see everything is on this one set of layers called office model. And importantly, I've tried to distinguish for you guys. This is usually what I do when I build the new energy model in Honeybee. I'm trying to distinguish those surfaces that are touching other interior surfaces. And we call those adiabatic surfaces, or surfaces across which there is no heat flow. And I'm differentiating those from the exterior surfaces, or those surfaces that are in contact with the outdoors. And this is obviously a very important distinction, because uh, if, if, you know, clearly if you're touching the outdoors, uh, you're going to be losing heat through those, through those surfaces in the nighttime when it's cold outside. You're going to be gaining heat when the sun shines through them. So it's important that you distinguish. This is probably the, one of the most important distinguishing uh, features of the geometry that you'll create for an energy model. All right, so with that, I mean, you guys can just make a box. There's no reason why you have to have this U-shape. I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to, to give you some context here so that we have a little bit at stake as we build this energy model. And, uh, and ARPIN should have probably also sent you some grasshopper files, uh, like the ones I have up here, that will show you where we're going to end up today. And I'm going to, fingers crossed, hopefully we're going to get through all of these, because uh, there's a lot in these files. But if not, you'll have them there as reference. Um, and we're at least going to get through the basic part of setting up the energy model and, and improving it. Uh, so with that, understanding that we're limited on time, let's dive right in right now. All right, so you guys should have, already have Ladybug and Honeybee installed, hopefully. I, you know, And if not, I gave you a link to that in the first few presentations. You can go all the way back, actually. The, yeah, you, you don't even have to be registered to the Ladybug presentations to see uh, the link to how to install Ladybug and Honeybee. Uh, and importantly also for this tutorial series that we're doing today, I should have actually sent out this install link and I apologize, but you can get there just by typing Open Studio. Uh, not all this other stuff, but just Open Studio. And if you go to that first thing that comes up and go to Downloads, just make sure that you, yeah, you download Open Studio, the latest stable release uh, for Windows. And that's, it'll just be an EXE, you run it, just take all the defaults, and, you're, and then you'll be set to go for all, everything that we're covering in today's session. Um, and, and, and just so you know also, that Open Studio installs both with all those capabilities that I, that I mentioned back here, of, you know, of the interface capabilities, installing with all these libraries to make it easier to run Energy Plus. And so Energy Plus is already included in that install. Um, so there's no reason to necessarily do that if you've already got Open Studio. Okay.
All right, let's actually build the grasshopper definition. So all of our grasshopper definitions, you guys are familiar with this if you've been following along already. You're going to start off by dragging and dropping ladybug, ladybug onto the canvas. And you may say to yourself, well, wait a minute, I thought this is a honeybee workshop. Why am I dropping ladybug on there? And the important thing to realize is that a lot of, a lot of the components in honeybee are building off of ladybug. Ladybug is a core set of tools for visualizing climate and for visualizing just any actually sort of hourly data over the whole year, which could be energy simulation results, as you guys will see shortly. Um, and, uh, and so